Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Just hold your Bible in your hand if you brought it and say this after me. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, and I'll never be the same. After today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, you know what, I need to spit this, I got a cough drop, and if I don't spit this out in something, it's going to become a projectile across the sanctuary and hit somebody in the head. Thank you. Let's try this again. <laughs> Put on the whole armor of God. No, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, in this passage, it actually describes three things that it takes to see the manifestation of victory in our lives over the enemy. How many of you know that at the cross, Jesus purchased our victory? But this describes three things that we need to see happen in order for that manifestation to take place. And we do come under the attacks of the enemy. How many of you have ever been under the attack of the enemy? He does, listen, the devil hates you. And so there are going to be situations, you know, the Bible says that in, uh, in this world, you will have tribulation. We don't stop there and cry. Amen. That passage says, in this world, you will have tribulation, but, I love the buts. I'm going to do a series sometimes on the buts of the Bible. <laughs> in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. I've overcome whatever tries to overcome you. I have overcome that. We are going to uh, have the attacks of the enemy. And it, this does not say, uh, for we might wrestle against uh, flesh and blood. Or again, this doesn't say we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we might wrestle against principalities and powers. This says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we will wrestle against principalities and the powers of darkness. So this describes three things in this passage about seeing the manifestation of the victory over the enemy. It describes, number one, what we do. It says, having done all. Having done all, number one, what we do. Number two, what we wear. It says, put on the whole armor of God. So it describes what we do, having done all, what we wear, putting on the whole armor of God. And then it says, it talks about what our position is. It says, having done all, we are to stand. Today, I want to talk about addressing our position, our position of standing. The armor of God, what we wear, has been taught on on this platform several times. In fact, our children's pastor, uh, Jody Mitchell, has a whole set of armor that he has worn on this platform as I've taught on it. And in fact, he wore it to a men's breakfast, I think last year, and taught on it. We've taught on the armor of God here quite a bit and what we wear. And then we also have done a lot, talk, uh, we've also taught a lot about what we do. Having done all to stand. Well, what is having done all? Well, there are several things that we need to do, but uh, the four main ones, if I may identify four main ones are to speak the word to walk in the spirit to walk in forgiveness and learn to pray we need to do those are four basic things in our life that we need to have under our belt when it says having done all how do you know if you did all i can't stand if i haven't done all how do you know if you've done all if you're speaking the word walking in the spirit walking in forgiveness there's a big one walking in forgiveness and learning to pray then we have done the four main ones. And there are other ones that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you or show you in your heart. After, we're, after we have done all, Paul is actually asking what position that we're in. He's saying, having done all, he's describing a position. Having done all, how many of you know standing is a position? How many of you could recognize I'm standing? 
How many of you know I'm not sitting? How many of you know I'm not lying down? I'm standing. Having done all, Paul is talking about the position, the actual position that we're in. Now, I want to ask, will you help me on the platform? Scott, will you help me on the platform? Bruce, will you help me on the platform? Come on up here. Let's give these guys a hand because they're really brave. They're coming on the platform, and they have no idea what I'm getting ready to do. So, let's see. I would like for you to stand here. And Bruce, I would like for you to stand in front of this chair. And Scott, yep. what's up, man? I'm going to lay down, right? Yeah, you are. <laughs> right here? Yeah, just lay down right there. So, would you please have a seat? Sure. Would you please stand right there? Would you hand me the sword, please? Now, the Bible talks about the armor of God, and our only offensive weapon with the, army of, with the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit. And so the Bible says, well, I just described to you, it says, having done all, we're, we're prayed up, we're speaking the word, we're walking in the spirit, and we're doing the fourth thing, whatever it was, we're doing those four things that I described, and so now we have done, what was it? Forgive, forgive. yeah, what, well, how could I forget that one? So we're walking in forgiveness, so we're doing those four things. So having done those things, then the Bible talks about what we're clothed in, which is the armor of God, and it says, having done those four things now, what position are you in? So now we've got Scott over here. Scott's lying down, and Scott has the sword of the Spirit. There you go, Scott. There's the sword of the Spirit. Thank you. How powerful do you feel right now? Not very. It's not, not very? It's kind of, that is actually kind of heavy, isn't it? And so how many of you know that this is a tough position for Scott to fight in? This is not a trick question. How many of you know that's a tough position for Scott to fight in? So he's, listen, Scott has done, he, listen, he's done all. Scott has been speaking the word. Scott has been walking in the spirit. Scott has been walking in forgiveness. Scott has done the other, what's the other thing? Pray. Scott's prayed up. I mean, he's done all of those things and he's got the sword of the spirit. But what I want you to see is what position he's in. He's lying down. And what Paul is saying here in Ephesians is, having done all, Watch your position. Having done, sometimes we think, having done all, how come, how come it's not, well, this is not working for me. I mean, Pastor Steve said if we'd speak all those Bible scriptures and we'd forgive, I had to forgive my boneheaded brother for all the stuff he did to me. I've done that and still this ain't working for me. It says, having done all, remember what we talked about last week about that incubation period of the Holy Spirit? I mean, remember that message. Okay, so now, having done all, the Holy Spirit's incubating the situation. What do we do? Having done all, we're supposed to do what? Stand. Well, so how many of you know this is not going to work? You can hand me the sword. Thank you, Scott. Let's give Scott a big hand. So then, now we got, having done all, how, how many of you are convinced laying down is probably not the thing to do? Okay, so now we got Bruce here, and Bruce is sitting down. There you go, Bruce. Now, Bruce is probably in a little bit better position to defend himself, but how many of you know this is not optimum either? Not a trick question. Yes. This is not optimum. Having done all, sit. Doesn't say that. And Paul is challenging what position that we're in. Having done all, what position are you in? Having done all, okay, I'm prayed up, I've done the four things and a couple of other things Pastor Steve didn't mention, so I should be good, right? I've got the armor of God, I'm clothed in all the right stuff, but Paul is saying pay attention to your position. Amen. What position is he, is he in? He's sitting down. So if someone comes to attack you with a sword, uh, how comfortable do you feel that you're in a really good position to defend yourself? Not really. No? better than scott better. yeah scott's toast yeah, he's dead. you know you you may have a slim chance but this is not an optimum position no, sir. no how many of you can see that this is probably not an optimum position to wield the sword you can give me the sword back let's yes, give sir. bruce a big hand thank you sir <laughs> having done all stand <laughs> so how many of you can see that this is a better position. 
This is a better position to be in, having done all to stand. So often the problem with being an overcomer is being out of position. It wasn't that we didn't do the four things or the five things or the, the, the six steps to doing this. And Pastor Steve said there's eight steps to victory and the, and the six steps to answer prayer and the five steps to overcome the enemy and all this. I did all that. So why do I still feel like I'm at a disadvantage? It's because after you've done all you got to be in the right position. What's the right position? Standing. Standing. When we're standing, we're in a position to see over the mundane and unimportant and over the distractions of the enemy where the real battle is. How many of you know Scott over here can't see very well? He's actually over here under the problem. And he doesn't have a very good vantage point. And Bruce sitting here, of course, Bruce is a tall guy. You can see how, taller than I can. But still, this is not a really good vantage point to be in, to be able to see what's going on. But when you're standing, you've got a vantage point. You can see over all the mundane. Did you know in the battles of life that we face, we so often are focused on the distractions. The enemy is a master of distractions. When the real problem is this, he wants you to focus on that. Do you ever notice that people are going to try to offend you and people are going to disappoint you and people are going to do all kinds of things to get at you? Right when you're in the midst of a battle, Satan is going to use people and use situations to get you distracted from the real issue the real problem but when you're standing you can see over all that stuff and you can begin to see in the spirit when we can see in the spirit then we can see what the real issues and problems are so now i want to talk with you about once we've done all how do we stand how do we stand we've done all how do we stand you want to know this yes. how do we stand ready you good I'm good. you look good I know. wow he knows he looks good all right once we've done all how do we stand i want to give you four things about how to stand you've done all you've done all that stuff now you're standing anybody in here standing besides earl any of you in your stand, how many of you, well, you know what, some of you may identify with, you know, we, we have to decide every day that we're going to stand. This is a daily thing. I'm going to stand. When you're dealing with things in your, in your life, whether it's health-wise, you've got that report from the doctor, or whether it's financially, or whether it's in your family, or whether it's relationships, or it's your business, or whatever it is, there are those situations and those times when we have to stand. We have to take a stand and sometimes i'm not going to ask for a show of hands don't want anybody to be embarrassed i want you to be blessed by this message but there are times when we get up and we and we go through the whole day laying down spiritually we're just kind of out of it i've been i know what it's like i've been spiritually out of it got up and went through the whole day and and if I'm not careful, the devil is going to slap me up the side of the head. And I'm just like, he's going to run. How many of you know it's easy to get run over when you're laying down? Sitting is a little better. It's like, I thought about getting up. I started to get up. Getting up was on my radar, but it never actually happened. Let's talk about how to stand. Number one, Philippians chapter four, verse one. Philippians chapter 1, chapter 4, verse 1 says, stand firm in the Lord. I started with this one because it's actually in the Bible five times of all the standing scriptures where it tells us how to stand, standing firm is in the Bible five different times. Stand firm. They're standing and they're standing firm. They're standing and then they're standing firm. Uh, you see what just happened how many of you saw that the first time I pushed him he took a step back it was like he didn't know I was going to do that what are you doing to me but you notice I started to, to push him the second time and he planted his feet did you see that first time he was not standing firm he didn't know what was going to happen the Bible says that we are to stand 
firm. They're standing. And then they're standing. I don't have to preach on this, do I? They're standing. See, he was standing before. Now watch him. Do you see him tense up when I walk toward him? <laughs> see, th- this is exactly what I'm talking about. The first time I pushed him, he was just kind of like standing there like, I wonder what's happening, what's going on, big deal. I pushed him. And so then, the, then when I took a step toward him, it was like, all right, now. The first time he was standing. Come on, who's getting this? The first time he was standing, now he's standing. If I go over there and try to push him now, Yeah, he's got a sword too. I need to be careful. <laughs> notice, I, notice I didn't say anything to him. Now, Earl, come on, buck up, man. Come on. I didn't say anything to him. All I did was walk toward him. Just walking toward him makes him tense up because he knows what's coming. And now he's standing. Now he's not just standing. Now he's standing. Some of us go through our day and we go through life and we're standing, but we're not standing. So it's making sense. We're standing. We need to decide, I'm going to stand firm. Everybody say, I'm going to stand firm today. And the attacks of the enemy will not move me. We're going to stand firm. And standing firm is simple. I, you know, I guess, I guess in true Steve Corona style, I could give you the five different ways the Bible says to stand firm. But standing firm is simply a resolve that I know what's coming. I know what's coming. And I'm going to stand firm. I, di- I didn't give Earl a lesson on six things to do to stand firm all I did once I pushed him once and then I turned and walked toward him he just automatically just bucked up stuck his chest out put one foot in front of the other and braced himself ladies and gentlemen the attacks of the enemy are coming I know two things every morning when I get up I know two things I know two things one is I'm going to have total victory that day no matter what happens to me. Amen. And number two, the enemy's going to attack me. I know it. The Bible says it. It's going to happen. So we, once you do that, you see, he didn't know when I walked. You're such a good illustration. Thank you for doing <laughs> He didn't know when I walked toward him the first time, he didn't know what was happening. But then the second time, he thought, There's, he's going to push me. There's an attack coming. You need to wake up every morning with two things on your mind. Number one, I will have victory today in any situation that I'm in. Say it. I will have victory today in every situation I'm in. Now, the second thing, and I'm not going to have you confess this. I'm just going to tell you the attack of the enemy is coming. I don't confess that every morning. Thank you, Jesus. The attack of the enemy is coming. I just receive it. I'm so excited about it. But I know it. I know it's coming. And so just bracing yourself for that so that halfway through the day, forgive me for being prophecy motivated, but that halfway through the day now, we're not crying and whining because the devil has attacked us. You knew it was going to happen all along, but you also knew you had total victory in it stand firm get up in the morning stick your chest out stand up and be somebody stand up and realize it doesn't matter what comes against me today i'm going to have victory in this amen Amen. let's give earl a hand you're you're good at this earl thank you sir actually you can take that down with you that's heavy we may need that again in just a minute number two 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 24 says that we stand by faith. We stand by faith. Also Romans 11:20 and 1 Corinthians 6:13 there are three different verses in the Bible that say we stand by faith. We stand firm and we stand by faith and You've heard me teach this. If you've been in this church 10 years, you've heard me teach this at least 100 times. Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith 
What faith is, Hebrews 11, 1, faith perceives as real fact what is not yet revealed to my senses. So some of you had problems with, number one, when I said two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to have victory in whatever situation attacks you today. Some of you had problems with that, saying that. Some of you said it because I asked you to, but in your mind, what you're thinking is, yeah, but I don't know what's going to attack me. How can I say that I have total victory today if I don't even know what's going to happen? What if this happens? What if this happens? But you see, faith, faith perceives as real fact what is not yet revealed to our senses. So I haven't seen the attack haven't felt the attack, can't smell the attack, can't taste the attack. With my senses, I can't identify the attack. But I do know what the Bible says. And so by faith, I know that I have total victory in every circumstance. If you're going to stand, then each day you have to tell yourself what to believe. I don't remember why I heard this this past week and as as many hours and as many years as I've been teaching on faith I have never heard this put like this before until this past week some of you may recognize and say oh he heard that here or heard that there but I heard somebody say your mind will believe exactly what you tell it to You see, this is what confessing the word actually is. Confessing the word, Matthew or Mark eleven twenty three and 24, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that those things which you say will come to pass, you will have whatever you say. Speaking the word, confessing the word, actually does two things number one you're speaking to the mountain you're speaking to the problem you're speaking to the issue you're speaking to the situation you're speaking to the sickness you're speaking to the financial issue you're speaking to the relationship problem you're speaking to the mountain number one and number two you're speaking to yourself that's why uh that's why uh romans ten seventeen says faith comes by hearing the word you're speaking to yourself and your mind and your heart believes whatever you tell it to that's, right. that's why the enemy is after that he doesn't want you to you know are you really are you going to say that are you going to keep speaking those healing scriptures you're just getting sicker and sicker and sicker because he knows that we believe our mind and our heart believe what we tell them to And so we continue to say that and continue to speak the word. So second of all, we stand by faith. Thirdly, Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 2 tell us that we stand in grace. I'm talking to you about standing. Now I'm not talking to you about these are not five ways to have victory four ways to overcome the devil that's all what this is what i'm talking to you about now is how to stand you have already done the you're already prayer praying you're already uh you've already forgiven people who have offended you you're already speaking the word you're already the fourth thing you're already doing why is it i can only remember three of those walking in the spirit why is it i can only in G- huh what you'll re- I, am i doing that on purpose so you'll remember them i like that thank you I can always depend on you to have my back, baby. Thank you. So you stand, first of all, you stand firm in the Lord. You just, you just got to wake up, wake up and buck up. I like that. I just came up with that. Just on. <laughs> number two, you got to stand in faith. And number three, you got to stand in grace. Grace is God's undeserved favor. God's favor is yours. You have the favor of God on your life. Psalm chapter 5 verse 12 says that God's favor goes before us as a shield. God's favor. We stand in God's favor. God God blesses us and God does things for us because we're his children and he loves us. God will do things. People don't like it. Some people have expressed some concern when I say this but it's absolutely true God will do things for you he won't do for other people 
because you're his kids. When my kids were small, if the other kids from the neighborhood came over and if I was giving out ice cream and the other kids came over, I'd give them ice cream too. There are things I would do for the other neighborhood kids when I did it for my kids. But when it was time to go to Disney World, I didn't take all the kids in the neighborhood. I took my kids. I did things for my kids. I didn't do for the other kids in the neighborhood because they were my kids. And when you are a child of God, God will do things for you he doesn't do for other people. It's not that he doesn't love them. It's that you're his. And so we need to walk in. We need to recognize God's favor over our lives and that God will open doors of favor and doors of opportunity for you. Expect it. Expect it. I expect God to open doors of favor for me, and he does. And fourthly, take a deep breath because this one's going to hurt. That always helps me. I don't like shots. I don't like blood tests. It's the reason why when I was a child, when I was four, I had rheumatic fever, and I used to have to have two blood tests a week. I had to have two blood tests a week for a year when I was just, just a little guy. And I don't remember it. It was traumatizing for me. My mom said I was fine with the blood tests until one day they got a nurse that couldn't get the blood out of my arm. And she kept, going, kept digging in this arm and then in that arm and finally got the blood out of my hand somewhere. And mom said by then I was screaming. Ever since then, I don't like needles. I'm not a big baby. I don't cry. It's just, you know, I, you know, you know what's on my, bu- I'm 65 years old. You know something that's on my bucket list? One day, I'm going to watch while they draw blood. <laughs> I have never done that. I've never actually been able to watch. But it always helps me. Because, how many of you know there are shots that hurt? And there are shots that don't hurt. Is this going to hurt? Nah, it's just a little stick. It's not going to hurt. And so I'm not a big baby. I mean, they can... You know, they can stick me. It's not a bit. But I appreciate it when a nurse says, uh, this is going to hurt. Thank you. You know what I do, don't you? I buck up. I got that from point number one. This is going to hurt. So take a deep breath. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 tells us that we stand together in one spirit. We were not created to stand by ourselves. We were not created. If you're going to stand, having done all to stand, if you're going to stand, you were not created to stand by yourself. And the devil wants to separate you from the rest of the church, from the life of the church. I don't know how many times I've talked to people, seen people in the grocery store, in a restaurant. Hey, haven't seen you in church in a while. Yeah, I'm going through a really hard time. That's the time to be here. Because the devil is, when the devil's pushing on you, when the devil's putting pressure on you, that's the time to surround yourself with other believers. We stand together in one spirit. I'm just going to tell you, as divided as we are as a country, I've never been, like I said, I'm 65 years old this year. Most of you were supposed to say you don't look 65. Thank you. Um, (laughs) And I've never seen our country more divided than it is right now. This is really amazing. I never thought I would actually see what I'm seeing today. And as divided as we are as a country, I'm more concerned about division in the church. I'm not talking about spiritual division. I'm talking about political division. I'm talking about the division that's in the world getting into the church. Satan is working overtime to divide us so that we will not stand together if you look at matthew in fact matthew chapter 12 verse 24 now when the pharisees heard when the pharisees heard it they said this fellow does not cast out demons except by beelzebub the ruler of demons but jesus knew their thoughts and said to them every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand if satan casts out satan he's divided against himself how then will his kingdom stand jesus is saying satan knows the power of division you're saying i'm casting out devils because i have a devil myself satan is smart enough to know that a house divided against itself cannot stand and that's why he tries to bring so much division into the church. It's because he knows that if he can cause enough division, if he can divide the church, 
then we can't stand and this is a tough thing to talk about it's a it's a tough thing to talk about in a multicultural church we've got people here who voted for donald trump and are proud of it we got people that voted for hillary clinton and they hate donald trump but let me say this to you as a church don't bring that in here i said don't don't bring that in here we are surrounded there there are people should i hey i'm gonna go i'm gonna go ahead and say this i have i have told people that are no longer here you need to go to a republican church i have told people that are no longer here you need to go to a democrat church is it what they should do is it good for them is it god's best for them no because heaven is going to look like this heaven's going to look like this heaven is not republican heaven is not democrat yes i mean there are political issues that there are political issues that are important to me and political issues that have to do with the word of god i'll talk about it from the platform and i'm not afraid to do that but this is not a republican church and this is not a democrat church and we're going to preach the bible i have people that ask me when are you going to talk about this when are you going to talk about this situation and that situation and when are you going to when are you come on pastor come on be strong and talk about this i'm going to be strong and talk about the power of the gospel and the power of the word of god to transform lives this is not i'm, I'm not we're not in here to talk about uh, our latest political uh turmoil and and uh, and all and it's not that i don't care it's not that i don't have strong feelings it's that that's not what this platform is for and we're not going to use it for that i'll tell you what's missing what's you know what's missing in our country is not what i'm here to talk about but it's crept into the church i'll tell you what's missing is dialogue and conversation people can't people can't talk with each other anymore and we need to be able to do that we need to be able to talk about that. I told you this was going to hurt. But we need this. If you, listen, if you voted for Donald Trump, why haven't you had a dialogue with somebody who can't stand him? Not so you can get in. The problem is we're afraid we'll get into an argument. Why, why can't you keep your mouth shut and try to understand somebody else's viewpoint? Why can't you just listen? If you can't stand Donald Trump, our president, then why don't you sit down and have lunch with somebody who just thinks he's the greatest thing in the world and ask some questions and just be quiet and listen to them and come to an understanding. And listen to You don't have to agree. But it's important that we're able to have a dialogue. Why is this important? Because the devil knows that division is the greatest weapon he has against the church. And I've talked to pastors, white pastors and black pastors, whose churches are all in upheaval and they've had people of all different colors and all different races leave because this group likes this and this group believes that and this group supports this and the pastor won't talk about taking a knee from the platform. When are you going to talk about that? And the Bible says if we're going to stand, then we need to stand together. Not in one political party. It doesn't say that. It says we need to stand together in one spirit. I want people to stand with me. I don't care. Listen, I don't care who you voted for. When I'm going through hell in my life, I want people of the word to stand with me. I'm not going to say, I'd ask, you to, I'd ask you to pray for me, but who did you vote for? <laughs> but that's, listen, that's what it's come to in our churches. We need to stand. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I'm almost done. I know this hurts, but the shot is almost over. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's not talking about the same political party. It's talking about the word, surrounding ourselves in the word and speaking the same thing when we're speaking the word of God. Where's Earl? Where's the sword? Come up here, Earl. Get the sword and come up here a second. Do you see him? But still, and you know, and Earl is, Earl, oh, come on, you do better than that. <laughs> come on, Earl. Hey. I got a sword in my hand. I know. Hurt you. Earl needs some help. I said Earl needs some help. Y'all going to sit there? Is that what the church does when people need Earl? Earl needs some help. Is that all we got? Earl needs some help. See, that's what the church does. Somebody needs some help. Somebody else will go. He's packing. <laughs> Now, Earl did pretty good before, but how many of you know I'm not getting to Earl? <laughs> this is exactly what I am talking about. If I hear one person say, you know, brothers and sisters, everybody needs a friend. When you're going through life, you're going through tough things in life, everybody needs a friend to confide in. No, you don't. You need a church to stand with you like this right here. And I don't want everybody to rush up here. I just, want you to, I just want you to think for a second. The shot's almost over. How many of you didn't move? Because somebody else was going to do it. Earl needs help. And somebody will go. I'm not going up there. Somebody will go. And some pe thank God some people did. This is what the church does. Somebody else will. Somebody else will stand. Somebody else will pray. Yeah, they're going through a hard time. Well, I'm busy. I got to get my kids to bed. Somebody else, will, somebody else will take care of this. The Bible says if we're going to stand, we need to stand together in one spirit. Got it? Thank you, guys. Okay, or all the attacks are over. Everybody stand with me. Did you get anything out of this message today? So, so having done all, having, do, having done everything that we were supposed to do, and, have, and being clothed with the armor of God, having done all, what do we do? Stand. Having done all, what do we do? Stand. We stand. We stand firm. Everybody say this. I stand firm in the Lord. I stand in faith. I stand in grace, and we stand together in one spirit. Amen.